Thank you, Bala. Thank you, Ajit, for the invitation. Pleasure to come and talk to you about these things. There are many in the audience who are part of our team, who worked on this, so for them it's going to be boring talk. Uh, for the others who are less familiar with this issue, I'll just go through it fairly quickly uh, regarding the nature of the projects, the kind of experiments we have, and uh, you know, sort of close with some, some things we learned from this process. Uh, so. Uh, we've had a satellite program that's been uh, nearly 40 years old uh, and science experiments have been part of this for a long time right from the first satellite that was launched but uh, more recently the last 15-20 uh, years we've had greater success in converting this into this is moving on its own, uh, into successful experiments and uh, we've had some experiments to study you know initially uh, work on um, look at X-ray astronomy at a time when X-ray astronomy was uh, starting to come up. Uh, solar physics we had some and uh, very recently looking at planetary programs. But in astronomy the big experiment that we're looking at is this uh, AstroSat. It's a dedicated satellite for astronomy, uh, largely trying to combine strengths of astronomy being uh, from different wavelengths. So it's a multi-wavelength satellite, uh, utilizes uh, optical uh, ultraviolet, soft and hard x-rays, so it covers a fairly wide band and, uh, and we do have some collaborations uh, from outside the country on this, on uh, the soft x-ray telescope and an ultraviolet telescope, we'll discuss that. As of now, uh, this is uh, after many, many years of work, it's now scheduled for a launch middle of next year. So we're fairly close to wrapping up uh, this long-term program. Uh, just a few slides on uh, why it's important to look at uh, a galaxy in multi wavelengths. I mean, you know, this, this is, a, for example, like a picture of the galaxy uh, you know, from radio, H1 emission, uh, then in X rays, where the, the plane of the galaxy is pretty much cut off because of absorption in the, in the galaxy itself. Whereas once you look at it in gamma rays, you see this plane pop back up because now we have, you know, uh, charged particles, cosmic rays interacting with the matter which produces gamma rays and we will see it. So the combined strength of multiple observations is certainly there. And that was sort of the theme in which uh, uh, AstroSat was considered. A second example would be if I look at specific sources like uh, um, you know, objects that are called quasars, microquasars, uh, qu uh, which are called microquasars because they're like, they behave sort of like quasars which are the edge of the universe, uh, highly high luminosity systems, but uh, these behave in similar manner and here is one of the galactic sources wherein we see uh, two blobs as observed in radio uh, stretched over some time, roughly a month's time scale where you see the two blobs move far apart and uh, if we look at the same uh, experiment, the, the time uh, temporal delay in the emission process as you see infrared x-rays and radio pop up at different times. And and when you put this picture together, it is a lot easier to understand the fact that when a plasma blob emerges from this jet, you know, transparency at different time scales makes the emission uh, pop up at different uh, wavelengths. So parallel studies or simultaneous studies at, across wavelengths is very critical to understanding uh, processes in these systems. So keeping that in mind, this uh, 
Uh, satellite was sort of conceived uh, about 1995-96 time frame. There were a lot of discussions. Uh, the community was sort of mature in X-ray astronomy. Uh, Paul, who is here, was part of that early team. Uh, they had done small experiments on the IRS P3 satellite. And so it was time to look at a dedicated satellite for astronomy. And so uh, the combined strength of ultraviolet uh, astronomy that was there in Indian in astrophysics and X-ray largely driven by TAFR and, uh, and at uh, ISRO uh, led to this formation of this astrosat. And that had uh, primarily a combination of UV and X-rays. Uh, even though payload experiments, the actual experiments were started in terms of laboratory design, laboratory experimentation started very early, 1998 I understand there was some money released to actually develop the experiments. But uh, as with many projects you will find you know everything slowly started around 2002 and now you know that's 12 years, that's a long time. Uh, none of us imagined it will get, to get anywhere close to it. I think I have posters in my room that's a 2006 launch. And every time I look at the many lectures I've given, the years have passed by. But I think we now have a fair amount of confidence that it can go up next year. Okay? Because then I'll show you some pictures which will tell us, yes, these guys have really shaped up and we are ready to do it. If you look at the uh, overall scenario in terms of ultraviolet astronomy, which is not, um, certainly feel that it's not expanded as much as other areas of astronomy in space. Uh, there was a very important experiment called uh, uh, ultraviolet explorer, what was it called? Suddenly forgot the name. What was it called? IUE, International Ultraviolet Explorer, which served the community for a good 18 years or so. Uh, good spectroscopic mission. But so only recently we've had some uh, follow up to these things. Fuse, which was a spectroscopic mission, uh, got, which contributed significantly, and Galax, which is an ongoing mission for surveying the universe in, uh, in, in UV. And, uh, in X-rays, of course, there's been a big boom. These are all large observatories. The Chandra X-ray Observatory, which is still in space. The NASA mission, XMM Newton from European Space Agency. SWIFT, which was, a, which was an experiment uh, primarily geared for gamma ray burst studies, you know, rapid uh, relocation and rapid follow-up of uh, gamma ray bursts. Also contributes substantially to the hard X-ray component. And now the Japanese mission Suzaku is there. And of course, there's New Star, a new mission that was launched recently. So there's a fair number of uh, competing. You know, but what is unique in AstroSat was to actually combine this such that at the same time you can observe sources at both broadband x-rays as well as an ultraviolet. And which as I mentioned earlier is very critical towards uh, meaningfully understanding processes in many of these systems. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we, a set of payloads were selected. And I'll just go through some of these very quickly. Um, but some of the critical parameters when we look at uh, experiments on for such uh, uh, missions is uh, 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 we basically want to make sure the signal to noise ratio is very, very good, which means you want detection efficiency uh, as large as possible, large geometric area, uh, because focusing is not always easy. Um, so we go for large geometric area detectors, high spectral resolution, angular resolution. Not as high as one would see in optical and radio, but uh, in X-rays it's getting down to a few arc seconds in some of these cases. Sensitivity, which is critical, which of course depends on geometric area, inversely on background, integration time, field of view, because you're surveying the sky, are all critical parameters when, when you go about the design of these experiments. So we have five experiments on board, a large area proportional counter which is a very sort of a standardized old technology in some sense. It's a workhorse that actually says, here is a big collector, proportional counters are very well largely used often in particle detectors. But large area critical because of the fact that it allows you to do timing at very short intervals of time. And timing is very critical, you know. Um, a clump of uh, 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 matter going around a compact object provides uh, demands high time resolution observations and so lax PC, this large area proportional counter is indeed one of the ones that can actually provide this uh, very high time resolution monitoring of uh, sources in the sky. So this is large area compared to what has been done so far. Uh, the sky is a very transient place in terms of the behavior of sources. So the time variability is very, very common. So you do, do need to actually ensure that there's something is monitoring variability elsewhere in the sky as the other experiments are looking straight at uh, 
the narrow part of the region, the re narrow region of the sky, roughly about a degree or so. So the rest of the sky is monitored using uh, the sky monitor, which actually rot is a rotating system, which searches for potential outbursting sources. Uh, we have this ultraviolet imaging telescope. It's a twin telescope um, geared for far, far ultraviolet and near ultraviolet. SSM is also x-rays. SSM is also x-rays in the 2 to 10 keV, yes. Um, and uh, then you have a soft x-ray telescope <coughs> operating at lower energies, 0.3 to 10, 8 keV. And then finally, a hard x-ray uh, mission that is designed on the basis of compound semiconductors, cadmium zinc telluride is a very popular detector these days. And so using that, uh, an imager is made which provides both spectroscopic as well as imaging capability at hard x-rays. Uh, let me just go through some of these in particular. UV, as I said, is, uh, has primarily a, a near UV and a far UV channel, but we've also put into it an optical channel for reasons I'll discuss. Uh, so it's uh, about a half a degree field of view. You have this coverage in these nanometers. There is a gap between 180 and 200. Originally, we didn't plan to do that. But as we look at uh, available filters, efficiency of filter transmissions, you soon come to the conclusion it's difficult to get filters in that band. So that has been left out. And the visible channel is used for actually deriving aspect. Uh, this has an angular resolution of about 1.8 arc seconds. The GALAX mission, which is out there today, and which has provided in some sense, the first large-scale UV survey has uh, angular resolution about three times, uh, three times larger than this. So clearly, the sharpest images in ultraviolet are going to come from this experiment. And a sensitivity which is in about you know, 1,000 seconds of exposure can see 28 magnitude stars. Um, if you look at the system, I mean, you really have a primary mirror here, a secondary mirror here, and these long baffles, which are critical because to remove scatter. These baffles are essential because you want to cut down the scattered light to one part in 10 to the 9. Um, and so we even ensure that this satellite, this particular telescope is not operated in the sunlit part of the orbit because scattered light can be significant. And you have to be sufficiently away from sun. Uh, further, this uh, detectors at the back of this. They're mounted, there are filter wheels in front of each of these detectors. Um, and uh, because it's operating in ultraviolet, there's a tremendous uh, requirement on making sure that these, this is assembled, this is handled, this is in an environment where it's super clean. Super clean would imply uh, dust free to a level that we have never done so far in ISRO. Uh, we need very, very clean room conditions. Uh, second, uh, we want to make sure any any um, the components on the experiment as well as on other experiments and as well as on the satellite are such that it doesn't outgas to a level where it can actually form even a thin molecular layer on top of the mirrors it will destroy the, uh, the sensitivity of this instrument. So one had to be extremely careful in the assembly and realization of this experiment. Uh, so and it has a fairly simple optical layout uh, for both the FUV channel, I mean the primary, secondary, filter wheel and you have your detector at the end of that. The near UV channel, uh, there's a splitter that provides uh, optical uh, near UV here and, an opt and a visible channel. And this visible channel is used to track the position, uh, get back the aspect of the satellite. Remember, the satellite is not an absolutely stable platform. Uh, there's jitter, which is fairly unpredictable. And then there's drift, which is sort of you know, long duration, long term. Uh, um, smooth variation in the direction. So one is easy to, so the, the drift can be corrected if I take frequent images and then you compare that with, uh, you know, so from frame to frame I can actually do a cross assembly, cross uh, correlation under which I can get back my uh, realign and actually pile them up. But if I really want to know which part of the sky I'm looking at, I need some stars in the field of view that have, from which I can reassemble the aspect. And the visible camera provides that uh, correlation. Uh, the detector is itself is an interesting detector, uh, wherein uh, primarily you have a, uh, an entrance uh, channel, and there's a photocathode that converts uh, the incoming electrons, uh, photons into electrons. There's a multi-channel plate, which amplifies it. And then there is a taper of fibers which leads it to a CCD, it's actually a CMOS device uh, from which uh, you're able to use centroid. It. Every photon that comes in provides a little bundle of light here and on board is centroided and the next Y position and time are derived. 
So that list forms the basis for actually doing astronomy with this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, the most important part of that is compared to Galax, we do have a significant improvement in the angular resolution. That's critical. The soft X-ray telescope operates in the 0.3 to 8 kV. Uh, it's uh, largely driven by the fact that you have grazing incidence because X-rays cannot be easily focused. The refractive index works out to be a little less than 1 because of the fact that, you know, uh, yeah, this term, this delta term goes negative. So you don't get good reflection. But in order to enhance the uh, signal or the area of the mirror, unlike the normal mirrors, the way you do is you create nested shells. You create a series of nested shells. Uh, two sections of it required to actually get a focus and you get a uh, focal length that may be 2 meters to 10 meters in some of these cases. So we now have designed something called the soft X-ray telescope which has a mirror, a set of mirrors at the top and, uh, and the CCD and X-ray CCD at the bottom and this is about 2 meters focal length and uh, this would provide uh, uh, focusing requirements up to about 0.8 K, 8 kV or so. Uh, and this, because it has a mirror, it is a truly imaging system, angular resolution of about three arc minutes. Uh, okay. Each of those mirrors are made up of uh, these, uh, sh the, the mirror itself is not made out of a single circular shell, rather they are made into quadrants. They are assembled into these little things and there is a very fine activity that has actually taken place at TAFR. Uh, Professor K.P. Singh is the PI of this experiment. And, uh, here is a picture of that. So you see a lot of little nested shells, 40 some shells are here in the two quadrants. Two of these precisely align such that you can actually get uh, uh, focus. And remember these things have to be shaken because it undergoes vibration when you're actually launching it. And at the end of the shake process, it must still focus. So that's the critical part of it. So we've gone through that process. It's actually all working well. And uh, there's a camera, the CCD camera. He is a fairly sensitive CCD camera. Um, this has actually been the contribution from the University of Leicester in UK. So TIFR has an agreement with uh, Leicester under which the camera component is provided by Leicester and uh, uh, cooled. This camera is cooled to about minus 80 degrees Kelvin to get the kind of sensitivities we are looking for. Now, once you go beyond about 10 keV, it's very difficult to focus. So we use uh, coded mask imaging, which is uh, nothing but the old concept of pinhole camera. If it's a pinhole, you'll get an image, but then uh, X-rays are so few. Uh, to increase the throughput, I put many pinholes, and many pinholes means better throughput, but at the cost of complexity. The image is no longer a simple image. But if I know what the what the uh, the, the nature of this aperture is. I can deconvolve this thing. So that's the concept behind the pinhole camera imaging. So you, uh, different sources at different positions will cast shadows on the detector plane and using that shadow in a unique manner, one can actually remove degeneracies and then derive imaging. So it could be one dimensional coded mask or two dimensional coded mask, both of which are applied, uh, are used on uh, AstroSat. Um, yeah, basically from different directions, you're going to get this pattern shift and use that as a basis to locate the position of the source. Not high angular resolution, largely driven by the, pixel, the pixelization of this uh, mask and the available detector resolution of the plane where the detectors are. And if you want to build large, large area, this soon becomes a big challenging task. Uh, it's not doing focusing, but it's only coding information. The scanning sky monitor, which I mentioned earlier, is, uh, is like a watchdog that looks for transient behavior, that looks for uh, detect, uh, uh, sources that are in outbursts, things that are changing its luminosity over time scales that we would like to study. So this provides an alert of, of roughly about half the sky at a time. So while the other experiments are looking in some particular direction for maybe an hour or two, sometimes a day or two, this system is constantly uh, rotating, uh, searching for possible transients in the one half of the sky. And that, and once you see it, and once you have confidence that this is indeed a transient that needs to be followed, because remember all transient behaviors you would like to follow as quickly as possible, a quick decision is made in a couple of hours to repoint the satellite towards this transient behavior. And that, uh, so that is, that the activity demands us to move very quickly. This data from this has to be analyzed very rapidly. Data from this has to be have confidence that this is indeed a real transient, not a fake thing. False alerts are cons of concern. So uh, uh, 
there is a demand on, for this experiment to be uh, for rapid analysis of immediate data. So transients of this type where you know this is the time dependent behavior, time light curve where you think something is steady all of a sudden it rises and this rise is what you like to catch uh, and which could be anywhere from you know uh, a day or many days and uh, that is the kind of thing we like to study. Uh, so, trans, uh, so there are a lot of such uh, sources out there that are constantly uh, popping up uh, in, in increasing in luminosity and as the sensitivity of the instrument goes up the number of such sources are going to be very large and we do have concerns that in the, in the center of the galaxy or the near, the near the galactic plane where the density of sources are very large you may see uh, a fair number of such sources can even lead to source confusion. Uh, this is basically once again a proportional counter, but it is a position sensing proportional counter where there are fine wires wired along this thing where uh, when, an, when an x-ray photon falls on it you can actually tell what is the position of that event on the basis of the charge you collect on this side and the charge you collect on the other side. So based on the ratio of these charges one is actually able to tell the position. So it is a position sensing proportional counter uh, and uh, three cameras that will cover uh, you know one two three so that basically and the whole thing rotates so it basically covers the, uh, the half the sky as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so here is the, the proportion of the, uh, the bottom and this is actually a, a one dimensional mask on top of it the mask actually casts a shadow on the wires and then the mask is scanning the sky so you are able to get this uh, 2D information regarding where the source really is. Um, and uh, this just shows uh, for each of the wires you can actually do this imaging. This is actually a spectrum drawn of a radioactive source that is uh, illuminating the detector and you can reconstruct the spectrum of the source. Though this is not a spectrometer by any chance, uh, but rather a quick uh, measure of uh, overall flux variations what we try to study. This is a reconstructed map uh, using the coded mask you can actually reconstruct the position of this source because you do know the mask, you know the pattern, you know the shadow and mathematically one can actually deconvolve that data to get back your source position. Uh, an area where we are often concerned is when this sky map is filled with many sources and how unique is, uh, is the deconvolution process is something we have to see if there are multiple sources here which are variable it starts getting to be a challenge trying to pull it all out. So, uh, so this would look at uh, as I mentioned earlier intensity variation across all of this all of this can be studied or oh, this I think the slide came a little early. Uh, but discovering new X-ray sources is indeed one of the key elements of this uh, particular uh, uh, payload. The cadmium zinc telluride uh, experiment is, uh, is an imager that works at hard X-ray so it's, it now covers the other part of the energy range 10 to 100 keV and uh, it is a solid state device uh, photon comes in produce electron hole pairs and you are actually collecting them and you have a coded mask in front of it two dimensional coded mass that actually will code this information from which you can get the, the direction and the, the imaging information of the, of the sky. Unlike the uh, standard proportion counter and a, and, a, and a scintillator type detectors these are higher resolution systems can actually energy resolution is much better. So this is primarily used for spectroscopic studies of uh, X-ray sources. Um, standard products that we have bought uh, as a CZT detector simple single array of, <coughs> of this type which have two ASICs at the back of it and 64 of these form the big array that is used to generate um, uh, to make up the complete CZTI imaging system. Uh, when you have a large number of such pixelated systems uh, the one concern of course is uniformity of performance you know. Uh, not all pixels behave the same way, they, they come and go, they have temperature dependent effects. So mapping them and studying it and tracking it is going to be one of the challenging things uh, that will come up with CZT. So four quadrants of this are assembled in a total of 64 detectors um, uh, and uh, where the mask, the two dimensional mask is sitting up here while the detector sits at the bottom of this uh, and these have been all assembled and uh, we have uh, about 50 kilograms, takes 50 watts and this is an indication of that of a qualification model that was made and vibrate and shaken and this is actually a radiator panel because in uh, these things require cooling um, you know not very intense cooling down to about originally minus 20 degrees. If you want to get minus 20 degrees in space 
uh, the simplest thing is to actually have a cold surface and you connect to that using a heat pipe and this is a radiator panel that provides that is going to see the cold space and uh, connected through heat pipes and it will cool the detectors down to the temperature that you want. So this is sized to your thermal requirement. Okay. Uh, in many of these what we found is of course uh, I am just taking this as an example where we began with a proposal where we want a certain requirement you know 5 percent or 60 kV resolution we wanted to do uh, goal was even better but as we come along we find these numbers are not easy to achieve we, the performance do suffer in some cases uh, we look at the implication of this so we have maybe come down uh, quite a bit in the energy resolution and uh, we look at some, in some of these cases we are looking at um, uh, featureless spectra, we may be able to get away without much of an impact because of the poor resolution. But in cases where you are looking for interesting features like this is our, these are cyclotron lines arising from which we could in principle derive magnetic fields, those will get smeared and there will be some potential impact of this because of the poor energy resolution. But these are standard things you run into when we are actually building these uh, experiments where you know 10 years ago you had an idea how you do it. You put it together, you realize it, things do not exactly work out the way you want. The last of these is a large area proportional counter. As I mentioned, it is uh, like the work, work cost of uh, the satellite because it is a huge uh, large area system that provides uh, 3 to 80 keV. Uh, it is not an imaging system, but uh, it provides a large collecting area and uh, using just to show me, yeah, it is a large, three of these such units are there. And then, you know it is like a, a meter by half a meter this tall mm -hmm. so fairly large system uh, occupies fair amount of space and weight on the system and this is uh, assembly of this uh, unit going on at TIFR um, and if you now look at the summary of all of these things what you see is uh, the soft x-ray telescope operates as in this low band this is the ones you there is an overlap between that and the LAX PC. This is an imaging system, uh, fairly good angular resolution, um, <coughs> area is small but on the other hand uh, typically source uh, intensities are large at these low energies so you can still make up for it. it has an angular resolution of 3 to 4 arc minutes. This is uh, not an imaging system, it takes a 1 degree field of view, it simply says whatever is in the field of view I am assuming is going to come from the same source. So. Uh, the non-imaging but provides large area which then as I mentioned earlier allows you to do very fine timing and I can look at uh, short term variations in light intensity from sources which is very critical to look at lots of timing behaviors in binary systems. The, the cadmium zinc telluride detector goes beyond uh, is there is an overlap between these two but the reason for including that is to actually look, utilize the high spectral resolution that comes from the solid state devices. These are proportional counters which are not high resolution systems, energy resolution whereas this provides a high uh, spectral resolution but does not have the large area that you really want to do timing but for bright sources one can do that. And then of course uh, the monitor provides all scale monitoring capability, gives you a crude position and once you repoint to that location using this one can in principle get a fine location of, that, of the new transient. The ultraviolet telescope uh, provides, it is not 1 arc second, it is 1.8 arc seconds. Uh, and uh, operates in this broadband giving both ultraviolet as well as optical data. Uh, so if you were to look at specific capabilities you are looking at uh, the fact that you have simultaneously uh, multi wavelength observations. So uh, not and, uh, the UV by itself is an, a very interesting uh, experiment because of its extremely high angular resolution capability. So a lot of good science can come just from the UV imager alone. Uh, however, in combination with the x-rays uh, this provides a sort of a unique, uh, uh, unique set to really do simultaneous observations and to understand many sources. So in spite of the fact that the, the x-ray component, x-ray capabilities are modest compared to the existing satellites are today orbiting, the combination is what is uh, most interesting. So that is the sort of the unique selling point of AstroSat. So this is sort of the cartoon model of uh, the satellite the, the, the center of the of the satellite you have the two UV telescopes, they all have these doors you have to worry about which way will open, uh, you have this lax species the three red boxes, the large area you have the soft texture telescope sitting on one side and you have this scanning scan monitor on, on uh, away from the sun and you have the cadmium zinc telluride 
uh, let's see, uh, the solar panels pop out. The sun typically is on this side of the spacecraft. So these doors open this way. So we don't want sun anywhere close to it. 45 degrees is the closest the sun is allowed to come. Uh, there are concerns uh, on the UV telescope, the sun gets too close. Um, and so one of the challenges would be to actually make sure the satellite doesn't uh, point to the sun at any time because there are filters, optical filters that are put on top of these detectors which could actually simply melt if you really uh, leave it uh, looking at the sun. Uh, you look at the comparison of the field of views, you have a uh, uh, soft X-ray telescope uh, about half a arc minute. A half a degree, you have lax species with about one degree, uh, U-weight about half a degree again. Uh, the scanning scan monitor, very large degree, 20, 10 degrees by 90 degrees because we scan a large fraction of the sky. And of course, uh, the cadmium zinc telluride being uh, also uh, you know, is a few, few degree wide, large, uh, large field of view imaging system. Uh, angular resolution wise, uh, uh, the lax species is a simple collimator, it doesn't really resolve it but it's an error of one degree. Of course, there are ways by which we can get finer than that through a scan routine. Uh, the scanning scan monitor provides crudely positions of sources up to about 12 arc minutes. The imager, CZ imager gives about 8 arc minutes. The soft X-ray telescope at 3 arc minutes. And uh, UWIT at, uh, you know, this is not a scale, but that's really down to 1.8 arc seconds. So, uh, we have a range of uh, angular resolutions available on the on the same satellite. Uh, we have looked at all these filter, filter transmissions are all available from which we can actually now work out what is the level of uh, uh, how much time we need to integrate to actually observe specific sources, effective areas are worked out and uh, the spacecraft in the deployed condition, uh, it is roughly going to be about at 650 kilometers. Uh, we do this 8 degree inclination because we want to make sure the spacecraft does not go through this uh, region above. Uh, Brazil, which is called the South Atlantic Anomaly. It is a region where there is a very high charged particle flux. And uh, these uh, X-ray detectors in particular, which have high voltages on it, uh, uh, would have to be, including the UV, would have to be toned down because otherwise uh, these particles will actually cause serious damage to the system. So, uh, in order to minimize the passage through the South Atlantic Anomaly, you want to, as well as to minimize particle flux that happens in the polar regions of our, in polar orbits. Uh, we had specifically requested uh, uh, for a low inclination orbit. So, that has been given This is uh, very unique. Usually, ISRO does not launch satellites in this low inclination and roughly it is about 1.5 tons, uh, fairly large satellite with the PSLV for a 5 year mission is what is being planned. So, when it observes this given source in the sky, you know, it's, as it goes around the orbit it is just pointing in one direction which could be for an hour or two, it could be for days in some cases because we are looking at long term behavior of X-ray sources, then we have to do it. Uh, so, one of the challenges have been this problem that the ultraviolet telescope is very sensitive, quickly uh, manages to detect sources, X-rays might take time. So, now you know while one is watching the other is sort of idling in some sense, that concern was there. We have to now consider it in the context of saying long term UV light curves can be produced by these observations. So, these are things we still have to work out how exactly the observing strategy has to be worked out. Uh, there are many challenges in the satellite from both engineering uh, platform pointing accuracy, stability is required as I mentioned drift can be corrected to some extent, jitter is very difficult, jitter comes whenever panel is moved, whenever you are dumping uh, momentum from the spacecraft, concerns of the contamination for ultraviolet. So, now we have completely new procedures to handle procedures for people to be there, how many people can be there in the clean room, everything is controlled, they are all covered up, you know, you have a cold, you are allowed to just have to leave the day, do not come on this day, all kinds of issues have to be addressed. So, contamination control has been a very serious concern. Uh, and uh, reorienting, because this is a, this is a, we are interested in transient behavior, gamma ray bursts occur. Of course, it is not tuned for gamma ray bursts, um, but in case there is a transient that is observable and you want to move, you want to move very quickly. I mean, you can't move quickly because you have so many constraints on the satellite. You can't be, you cannot come closer than the sun by 45 degrees. You can't be close to the moon by something. You can't be close to the Earth's albedo. When you put all those requirements together, it just turns out to be quite a challenge to actually move very quickly to any part of the sky that you want to. So, uh, the people who handle the mission, who design 
what route do we take to get from point A to point B, uh, having a difficult time handling astrocyte requirements. Um, mirror fabrication, first time we're taking up in this country, very successfully done, long process, and the TIFR, an excellent work has taken place that led to the formation of these mirrors, so that was a major challenge. Um, rotation of this uh, scanning scan monitor continues to be a big issue, though not as challenging as we originally thought. Uh, optics, UV optics, the structure, the calibration, all has been very important areas. And uh, complete management of science data, which is not always easy. You know, if it all comes down today, we don't know how we manage it, though so we have some plans, but uh, not easy. To really convert that into usable science rapidly, quickly getting this process, all these things have been worked out, but it was, it is indeed, uh, continues to be a bit of a challenge for us to do that. So very briefly, some issues on what science we can do. Processes are all well known, processes that, uh, astrophysical processes that we are all interested in. Our objective often is to understand what is the process giving rise to the emission that we are observing. Uh, but we have only these kind of observing capabilities as looking at timing, looking at imaging, looking at spectral nature, uh, spectral uh, broadband spectra to actually address the processes that we are of interest to us. So, High resolution timing is that we really like to go down to milliseconds to microseconds for very important, especially in x-rays, there is a lot of interest in doing that. Uh, imaging combined with UV and soft x-rays is an important thing and uh, broadband spectrum. When you really put the spectrum across this band uh, consistently because this satellite is looking at a given source, all of them are looking at the same source. To often we try to assemble this data of broadband spectra using different satellites and many a time the times don't match. You may miss the exact point that one is interested in. So objective here is to actually make sure we actually have simultaneous data available from these things. Uh, UBIT, as I said, high angular resolution. So that would really mean, you know, morphology can be better understood. Uh, you will resolve better, you will see deeper. Uh, very important to look at luminosity functions. You know, so when you look at and, and star formation studies, UV will provide very important inputs even though IR is another place where we can actually get this. Uh, luminosity functions are important because you have got a better angular resolution, you go deeper, you can actually resolve and source confusion. Look at and finally even derive uh, contribution of the UV background. There are numbers from galaxies, we can improve upon these things and, and if time permits, we would like to look at specific some region of the sky which is for very long periods of time, deep observations. You know, we've had with Hubble and with Chandra, people have looked at specific regions of the sky where you look very deep into the, into the universe and you see very interesting, uh, you know, galaxy uh, morphologies that have not been seen. Of course, UV, we haven't gone that far but this experiment could actually push the frontier in terms of the deepest observations with the highest angular resolution telescope. In, uh, if you look at, uh, the X-ray binary systems, which are of um, great importance to a lot of people in the team. Uh, <coughs> an important component that uh, could arise is the, the primary X-ray source, the binary uh, source, the accreting systems typically show a lot of variability and uh, critical issues are what drives this accretion, what drives this um, rate of accretion, you know, what is being pushed into it and what comes out because what we see as X-ray emission is largely the inner part of the disk where the, the, the matter has become so hot it emits X-rays. But the injection into the disk at some level uh, happens at lower temperatures and the UV emission could actually give us some useful information in terms of what, what is poured into it and what comes out at the inner disk of the compact system. So hopefully simultaneous studies would be very critical for that. Time variable uh, behaviors, data from Paul's early work, you see a lot of variations. The same source shows all kinds of crazy behaviors. And today, the objective is to actually look at this in finer time scales. And so, the LAC PC with its large area, good timing, can actually provide uh, a really good handle on, uh, on the temporal behavior of these sources. Uh, actually, I've already discussed this emission in the inner part of the disk and the UV emission outer disk. Temporal data, as I said, is overall, in all cases, temporal data gives rise to important inputs on rotation, arrival time. Uh, outbursts, of flares, which is critical if you can actually map that in across the wavelengths is very important to understand the nature of these processes. Active galaxies, which are uh, high luminous objects, uh, but which also are very similar to these binary systems and hence uh, the, mention, the point I mentioned earlier, microquasars. But these are real quasars, which 
also exhibit supermassive black holes at the center of these things and eject matter at, uh, in radial directions. Uh, emissions from this, of course, we do not resolve this in any manner, but uh, you will actually see time variable emission uh, arising both from the disk as well as from the jet. And, and uh, the question would be to see if we can actually uh, provide details on these processes by assembling the spectral distribution from optical to uh, hard x-rays uh, simultaneously. Uh, they, these systems show lags between uh, across wavelengths, you know this is a particular case of PKS 2155 minus 3 or 4 which shows emission at, uh, at, at lower energies coming later and later. Of course, the same source has been studied other times and we find this does not show it. So, there is nothing typical of these issues, but the important point would be that uh, uh, if we could actually map this simultaneously many things could come and that is sort of emphasized in this slide here where you have this source 3C279, a blazar, a, a quasar where you are looking down the jet and hence high luminosity system as we observe it. And this is a spectrum that extends all the way from radio up to gamma rays, TV gamma rays. And uh, it, the broad spectral distribution is understood in the form of a synchrotron emission and, 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 and where soft photons again interact largely with the same electrons that produce a synchrotron emission, upscattered by inverse Compton to higher energies. And, but at different times of activity you find this uh, behavior changing quite a bit. You know, so it is very critical to observe them both where that, the, in the synchrotron component is also observed as well as the inverse Compton component is observed and AstroSat provides precisely these two things. Of course, not all blazars show this break right here in the middle, they shift uh, the luminosity these, the peak of this often shifts to uh, higher and higher energies, but this combination detectors actually provides very interesting capability to monitor the, these two primary uh, process components whose variability, relative variability and variations have to be understood to really, really make some sense out of these things. Uh, as a long duration observation, as a, you know, as I call a special observation, and not everybody is uh, excited about this stuff, but it is something that we thought could be useful and that is to really look at, uh, if you were to look at uh, really long periods, like a few month observations, where maybe towards the end of the mission we might be able to do it, uh, processes by which you can actually see the central source of an AGN actually undergoes a variation, variability, you know, luminosity change, you could see the continuum variation as well as you will see uh, emission uh, coming from the clouds, but with a delay, delay arising from the fact that geometrically they are far off. And if we can do that, we can in principle map out, you know, geometry of these systems. So that is reverberation mapping. Not easy when you do not have certain other behaviors, but uh, with using some ground observations as well, we may be able to do some, uh, something to actually address actual geometry of some of these sources. So complementary data at the same time as it continues to could come from Swift, Fermi at uh, gamma ray energies, which provides nearly every three hours you are getting uh, coverage of the sky. So most of these active galaxies you are actually able to see in, in gamma rays as well. So with AstroSat and Fermi, you really got broad coverage. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, uh, these complementary observations are also critical to really complete the story in some sense. Uh, it's a collaboration that is made up of a large number of institutions, TIFR, IAA, IUCA, RRI, various sister centers, physical research laboratory, Baba Atomic Center, Research Center and the two uh, foreign collaborators with us, the Canadian Space Agency and the University of Leicester. Uh, there is a pipeline we have developed, uh, just showing one example of a pipeline for UV, we have to really worry about uh, everything down from you know, a spacecraft internal, whatever happens, it is transmitted to ground, there will be errors in transmission, you have to worry about that. Uh, then uh, decode it, separate them out of different payloads, convert into level 1, level 2, uh, create sky images in this case, and worry about corrections to drift of the spacecraft. So, there is a fair number of things before you are ready for to hand data over to people to actually do analysis. At the end of the day, we also need to make sure that the calibration uh, which always, even though we do ground calibration, we still have to do this in, in on board. So the first six months of the mission, we spend calibrating all instruments. But the calibrated data, calibration data has got to be used to convert that into meaningful uh, 
uh, instrument performance parameters and, and so that the inversion can actually take place in a, in a meaningful way. Errors can be derived I mean, that's the most critical thing. I can always quote a flux, but then you'll ask me, what's the error on this flux? That's the most important thing. Not easy to come until we get the calibration right. So, that, so there is a scheme set up to do these things. There are places that require, as I said, attention. That is, continues to be uh, on calibration issues, uh, largely from uh, the flight instruments. So that is now being worked out at some level. Interpretations have to be ready. We really need groups that are working on these issues. There is, for example, next week there is a meeting of, of a small group of uh, people in the country waiting, looking at the spectral energy distribution of AGNs, how to model it, how to, you know, so that when the data comes, you're ready with it. Uh, we need to have many more such groups working on various science areas, uh, not as, as it moved as much as we would have expected it to do. We need to plan the complementary ground observations, you know, optical observations, radio observations, uh, all have to be worked out, still uh, not complete on those issues. And uh, at the end of the day, we hope to have some of these end products from Astrosat, you know, maybe many of these uh, the connection between quasars and microquasars, nature of transient behavior, quasi-periodic oscillations, um, spectral states and luminosity and source intensities. This is something that people have been studying. Uh, a lot of people have been working, doing the thesis uh, in these areas. But Astrosat has good capability to address these things. Uh, geometry, as I said, may be a long-term goal. And certainly with UV, because with high angle resolution, there are many things we can do with it. I'll just uh, close with some of these pictures. These are actual pictures of this engineering model of the, of the UV telescope. Only one of these things. This is with both actual flight models. These are fairly large things. This is roughly about two meters, a little more than two meters. Two of them, they have to be connected together into one big structure. Uh, this is the scanning schematic. One of them, there are three such units that sit on a big platform. Soft structure telescope, here is the mirror. At the end of that is where you'll put your CCD. These are close up of the mirrors, engineering model mirrors. The large area proportion counter, you see this fairly large uh, uh, counter, lots of wires in it, uh, very tedious work. In order to create a one degree field of view, you have to create a collimator, which is extremely uh, painful. It has to be multi-graded thing. There are multi-layered systems that have been put together to create a one degree field of view collimator. So it's that collimator is fairly tall. I mean, this is uh, about 45 centimeters? 70 centimeters. 70 centimeters. Oh, it's really big. Yeah. So that's a major job. Uh, the back of that detector is filled with electronics to save space. Uh, here is a, one of the lax species leaving TIFR. This is being undergoing some tests and we put them in this thermovacuum chambers where we evacuated under 10 to the minus 6 tor and we cycle temperatures between about minus 20 and plus 50 to make sure it doesn't, you know, survives both is in the form of a workmanship. You know, if there is a problem with you know, somebody, there's a bad solder joint, it actually will pop up. But it also ensures that it survives those kind of temperature fluctuations and all systems work. So while it's inside a chamber, we'll be operating it to make sure all is well. That's an important part of testing it. Many a time we've had problems at that, that test. We also do what is called an EMI, EMC test, electromagnetic interference, and, uh, and that's, this is to ensure that other systems don't interfere and this and the payload itself doesn't interfere with the commands of the spacecraft and or other payloads. All that is done, here is being shipped to Isaac, it's come to Isro Satellite Center. Uh, there is an onboard purification for this. This gas in this large lax PC is made as xenon, which is very susceptible to contamination. So there is a cleaning system on board that's operated uh, maybe once a month. Uh, so that is already in place. Uh, we look at all these materials, are just an example of this. I mean, maybe we have to really list it because we want to make sure nothing undergoes uh, outgassing at a level that disturbs the UV system. Uh, we also have to make sure they're all high strength alloys. They are uh, low thermal conduct, uh, thermal expansion systems and so on. Uh, this is an example picture of uh, the UV telescope sitting in this fairly large chamber. It's a thermovac chamber in uh, ISRO. Uh, customized uh, to actually make sure the appropriate temperatures are around this uh, UV telescope. Um, and uh, we've recently had a little problem with this UV telescope. Everything was ready, we were all fine, it was vibrated. Last point, all of a sudden the visible channel doesn't show any signatures. And so uh, right now it's under investigation. We, we believe uh, something in the primary 
CCD, the CMOS chip, some wire bonds have broken. And they're investigating that. But this is, I just want to show it as saying it's one of those things that you really run into all the time. So last slide, uh, we've learned some lessons in this whole process. And the lessons include um, too small a team to build such a large observatory. Absolutely too small a team. And sorry, what happened? Okay, I'll go to my last slide. Uh, second was uh, was uh, we have very few graduate students. You know, you look at how uh, how uh, projects are done elsewhere in the world, and you'll find a very large number of graduate students involved in this. And it's very critical because it's a fantastic training for them, and uh, they work all you know all day and all night cheap labor, but more importantly, they focus because it's their thesis work, they really do some work, it's very important. So that, that level of dedication cannot be replaced with some project appointments and other things. It doesn't always come, so we are missing that. And uh, what was the final point? I don't remember. There's one more. <laughs> I'll get to that. Uh, Inadequate time for internal discussions and meetings. We hardly meet. These experiments were all happening in different places. People sit there. Once in a while, we'll have a meeting. But I think uh, we paid a price for that. Uh, we don't have a peer-driven schedule. Schedule is driven only because ISRO calls and says, oh, where is it? Which is very bad. I mean, it's really, it's our requirement to do it. So we've been, that's, I think, is a, and system performance. System performance should not be, uh, I shouldn't get up there just to satisfy somebody. I should do it because I want to make sure this payload is the best. I've done the best thing I can do to achieve it. We may not achieve its final original goals, it doesn't matter, but I, we have to make sure it, it does what it can do best as of today. And I think because it's a long delay, we've lost some enthusiasm. And that's a pain. And I say some of these because I think these are, <laughs> these are potential issues for any large scale project we might undertake in the country. It's because we all start with enormous enthusiasm. A uh, lot of sincerity, a lot of people are there. But sustaining it is, I think, one of the hardest, most challenging things to do. All right? So I'll stop there. So, uh, uh, you know, we have Bangalore as a station that uh, where we are able to command it. Because we have to, to tell it to repoint, I have to command it, and so I may have access to it. Um, in an emergency, we, there are other places we can use it to command. But right now, we're looking at Bangalore as a single station to command. Keeping that in mind, it would roughly take us about four or five hours. Someone will have to run quickly through this process of how to get there. And if you are there in that particular orientation, Will it satisfy all the constraints that the experiments have imposed on it, including power availability for the panels? All those have to be worked out. So there is a team that can respond, but we don't expect a response faster than, say, uh, four hours or so. Yeah, yeah. I mean that is. Uh, I mean, ISRO has a team that can do that. If tomorrow Paul calls up and says, "All right, there's something going on there," as you said, at this location, RA, this deck, this. They're going to sit down very quickly, put that in, run through their program, make sure that all constraints can be met, reprogram or uh, generate the commands required to actually reorient it. Because you may not even go straight, you may have to go differently depending on the orientation of the spacecraft. So, four hours, five hours, we should be able to do it. Okay. If it requires data from the satellite to come down, like the scanning scale monitor, then we have to spend a couple of hours analyzing that data. That might take some time because it's only when it's about Bangalore, you can get the data takes some time to process the data. Then a decision has to be made you know, to get our people together and say, hey, should we go or not go? You know, you know, fight over that for three hours. Then <laughs> we point. In, in two hours, we might be in the point. The problem with the delay has three components. One is your planning. One is decision. 
and one is execution. Execution is probably just one or two delay. Yeah. Satellite has to come over Bangalore, yeah. come back over Bangalore. Whereas planning might be, as you say, planning. a few hours. Yeah. Most of it will probably be the scientific decision. Yeah, yeah that's why I said it's you the decision to. deciding that you know, we are going there. That, that very strongly opinionated community. <laughs> yes. You briefly mentioned the GRBs. Okay. Is there a real possibility of using this army of satellite you know, instruments to follow up uh, GRBs in multi-million? I mean, GRBs, when you say GRB, typically we're looking at seconds. Yeah. Want to really look at it. Of course, if you want to look at the long term evolution of a GRB, something that goes off and then does it again, does it again, you know, re uh, comes up once again, etc. We can indeed do. So the quick response that typically satellite like SWIFT does. SWIFT is designed to really move very rapidly. We can't do that because it's not designed to do that way. However, given our small fields of view, we don't expect to see it naturally, almost by chance in our field of view. That probably is very small. So just as you just mentioned, if tomorrow they say, here's an interesting GRB we really want to look at, and there's a common decision to move, we could do that. But then it'll take us these four hours. We could do that because the time scale is slightly later. Yeah, exactly. So that's the kind of thing we'll have to do, but we don't sell it very much as it because gamma ray bursts are going to be there all the time. I mean, you know, you know, every day how, how do you decide to respond to each of these things? And we'll be only doing this issue. One of the primary things we have to decide is how often will we respond to a transient when you and sacrifice your standard steady observing plan. So the balance has to be met. But fantastic science could come. If you do respond to transients. And uh, do you have policy of the data at all? Policy, there is a policy that's been worked out because, you know, we we'll say for the first 18 months, we're going to keep it in our pocket for the primary payload developers. Of that, six months is, is it 18 months and now one year. We thought we'd keep it one year now, right? We decided one year, one year. One year. Ah, we've brought it down to one year now. First six months is calibration, so which we have a lot of work to do. So the basic statement is, you know, those who spend 10 years working, let them exploit a bit of it. But at the end of that, it becomes open. And then from the, after the first year, uh, there is open time for people to propose, both Indian and then later international. So there is a target of opportunity, like you can... That's right, yeah. Target of opportunity, if you decide 10% or 5% of time, we'll have devoted target of opportunity. Tomorrow you could propose a target of opportunity. That data, the policy we're saying, will be immediately open. Ah, so the duration of the mission. Yeah, duration. What can decides it? It can be extended quite a bit. It's just that we we, um, we have to plan something because every all systems on board have to be designed to ensure it lasts five years. For example, a gas counter, you have to say what is the minimum leak will permit it? That is based on the five year time frame. But if it doesn't leak and other things work, you keep going. It can go. It can go. Nothing as of now expendable. The only thing is a potential leak in the two detectors that have gas based things. Was the, you know, the orbit. orbit. Orbit decay. That's another possibility. But see, this satellite was designed such that we didn't we don't have additional fuel for reboost. Many a time uh, spacecrafts are pushed up at some point because to prevent decay in this. Here we decided not to do that. At 650, at the end of five years we come down to 500, 500 or so, 550, 500 kilometers, depending on the solar cycle. It all varies with this solar activity. Once you go below that, you have many other problems, like atomic oxygen is very corrosive. It's actually around 500 kilometers will have it. So there are other dangers that come with it. We don't have reboost capability. No fuel reserve. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And then you just want to look at the later part of the case. Yeah, yeah. For that, Bernie has to tell you that, hey, we saw the GRB, we said 100 GG or whatever. So it's not that you have to do that. No, no, it's true. Correct. I mean, we do, we will be responding to all these alerts which are available now. As Paul said, the real decision would be for the team to get together and say, it's worth going to that. So clearly, in the early part of it, we're going to certainly respond to a few of these things. And then one has to make a decision how worthwhile it is to go to the next one. That's a human yeah. component that has to be addressed. Regarding GRBs, uh, any of the input comes from SWIFT, how long is SWIFT going to last? I don't know. It's a big question. As I was talking about it, I was yeah, also wondering. SWIFT is not there, you will not know GRBs. No. Uh, 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 Fermi can... 
Well, it doesn't have angular resolution at that scale. Yeah, it will be coarse, whereas Swift today provides excellent. That's right. Why? But remember, I know, correct. No, no, we don't see the track. You're not imaging the track. So all you're seeing is the energy deposit in the in the counter. And so now if I keep it open, all kinds of sources can contribute and I have no idea. So I restrict my field of use to one degree. Artificially restricted. That's correct. That is the collimator that is actually, yeah, exactly. Um, ideally we'd like to image it, but then, as I said, then things get very complicated.